All right. Uh, good afternoon. Let's get started. Thank you very much for attending. And um, this is uh, pretty special. And, and it's our pleasure to have Professor Jay Austin from University of Minnesota Duluth giving a secular GLERO uh, Great Lakes seminar this afternoon. Uh, so um, I'll spend a minute to uh, introduce Jay. Um, Dr. Jay Austin is a professor at the Large Lake Observatory in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Minnesota Duluth. He's a physical oceanographer or luminologist <clears throat> with broad interest studying a wide range of uh, process on large lakes, um, including thermal structure, role of ice, climate change impact, acoustics, and convective process. Uh, he's primarily in observation as uh, utilized all kinds of uh, instrumentation, moorings, AUV gliders, autonomous profiler uh, to collect data and study lake process. Dr. Austin uh, received his undergraduate degree in physics and mathematics from uh, Caltech, not Caltech, Cal Poly, Poly uh, St. Louis, Poly, yeah, and PhD from MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution joint program in physical oceanography. He has been at UMD since 2005 and just stepped down from the department chair. That's right. Right. So yes. he's a full professor doing teaching and research uh, in the Great Lakes region. Uh, we have a record here. Um, I think according to Michelle and Nicole, we have more than 49 remote registration participants. I think that's a record and currently has more than 30 signed on already. So, well, Good. if you are interested in um, Professor Austin's research, uh, I'll be glad to share his 28-page CV with you. So just <laughs> let me know. Okay? Well, Great. All yours. Oop, uh, I've got one here. Great. Thanks, Phil, and thanks for the in introduction. So I, I've been coming to GLURL once or twice a year for about 15 years now, and I think this is the first formal seminar I've given here. So I'm, I appreciate the invitation, and I'm looking forward uh, to the opportunity to tell you about... Can we turn the speakers down a bit? Or is that... Do we need them in here? Um, an opportunity to talk about some of the work that I've been doing recently. Um, so I want to talk about what it really means for a lake to turn over. We've all heard this expression forever and ever, the idea that um, a lake has this transition from being negatively stratified in the winter to being positively stratified in the fall or in the summer. And I'd like to do a little bit more of a deep dive on that um, idea. Um, and to be very clear here, um, so again, I'm, in, I'm at the Large Lakes Observatory, and I'm also in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. As Phil mentioned, I'm happy to have stepped down as department head this last year. Um, uh, but this is obviously not something that I've done by myself. There's a long list of characters, and I just want to, I'm going to do my acknowledgments up front here really quickly. Um, I've had a handful of wonderful colleagues at UMD, um, students, uh, Grace Weber and Kaylin Weiss, um, both in the physics department. Uh, Craig Hill, who was my marine tech, but is now an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at UMD. Um, Erica Green has done a lot of the work with the um, a, a velocity microstructure profiler. Um, and my colleague Sam Kelly has been invaluable as well. Uh, the co-PIs on, um, on this work, uh, we have funding now from NSF to study this, um, are Alberto Scotti um, at the University of North Carolina, who does um, computational work on very small scales, uh, and Stephen Llewellyn Smith, who's at Scripps uh, in La Jolla, uh, who does theory. And then we've added recently uh, Alex Forrest um, and his graduate students at UC Davis. We lost our glider in our lab, um, as many of you may be aware, uh, last summer. Um, they've stepped up um, to do a, to some glider deployments with us. Uh, the nice thing about that is that they have a glider with a lot of really nice um, instrumentation on it, uh, including a micro rider um, turbulence sensor. And so it was actually value added having them uh, instead of the glider that we had. Um, what I'd like to do today is <clears throat> give you a, a brief introduction to the problem, why we're interested in studying this, um, some early results that were published in a manuscript um, earlier this year, and then um, this is the first opportunity that I've had to speak in a public forum about some of the results from our um, field campaign this um, spring and summer. So I'm really excited to share those results with you. So convection is a ubiquitous process in fluids in, in nature. Uh, and the idea here is you have a flux of buoyancy, typically heat, um, at one boundary of a fluid that causes the fluid to become unstable. 
and that instability manifests itself as what are called convective cells. And in a very typical situation, you have a flux of heat. In this, in this case, this is a pan of water sitting on a stove, for instance, where it's being heated from below. That water becomes less dense and then rises through the pan. And then there's a flux of heat out at the surface. And so it reaches some sort of steady state where heat is being transferred um, through, this, through this medium. This occurs on an enormous range of scales. And so here's, here's some silicon oil, silicone oil in a pan. And you can see these beautiful convective cells. Um, it's just, it happens to be very easy to visualize with oil uh, in a pan on a stove. Um, but also um, the formation of cumulus clouds. Um, the Earth's um, atmospheric, uh, the general circulation of the Earth's atmosphere is dominated by convection. Um, the formation of deep water in the ocean um, is um, driven largely by convection in the Weddell Sea and in the East Greenland Sea that forms water that sinks into the abyss. Um, uh, here's um, thermal convection uh, and plume formation in the Earth's mantle. Um, and then the surface of the sun, if you look at the sun through a telescope with the proper filters and all, it'll look granular. And those, gra those grains are actually individual convection cells on the surface of the sun. Um, on a more whimsical note, um, if you're watching your miso soup cool in a Japanese restaurant, um, you'll see little convective cells form there. Um, and recently, um, I was rendering some wax um, from, our, from our beehives, and um, convection cells formed as it was cooling down um, in, the, in the kitchen sink. Okay, so what does all this have to do uh, with lakes? So when sunlight is incident on the surface of a lake in the spring, where the water temperature is below the temperature of maximum density, we expect the water at the surface to heat up. And in that case, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, heating the water makes it more dense, and that water wants to sink. And so people realized this relatively early on. There are papers from the early 1900s over a century ago. Uh, Burge and Barnes wrote on this um, uh, in Nature and in Science. Um, realizing that there should be this convective process. Um, Woodcock and Riley um, recognized melt patterns in small ponds as convective cells. It's sort of hard to see in here, but you can see these sort of vaguely hexagonal cells with a little dark spot there. That represents melting um, of the ice in, in these, due to the convection cells underneath the ice as, as sunlight shines through the ice. Um, the first systematic study that I'm aware of, um, and I just read a great paper by Sally McIntyre's group on the plane ride over here, where they there were a couple of other convection papers I wasn't aware of, so I, I'll say this with a little bit of a, a with little bit of reservation. But the first systematic study where someone went out in order to study this process was David Farmer uh, in the 70s. Um, uh, experimental work uh, in Babine Lake in 1973, uh, published in 75. Um, and they used um, a moorings, but also electrobathy thermographs, which was a predecessor to the CTD, where they looked at the thermal structure under the ice um, during the spring and looked at this convective development. Um, they were primarily concerned, he was primarily concerned with the erosion of stratification below the convective region. Um, but still, he recognized this as a convective process, and, and some of the work that he did in this will be reflected in what I talk about today. Um, there's a whole bunch of, like in the last 20 years, this has caught on. And there are a lot of examples in the literature, especially on shallow ice-covered lakes, especially European lakes, um, that I could go through here. Pavilion's actually in California. Uh, Forrest is Alex Forrest, who I mentioned earlier, um, who's running gliders for us. Um, there are, um, so this is actually Simcoe, which of course is Canadian. This is uh, Matt Wells' graduate student, uh, Yang, uh, up at um, Toronto. Um, I published a paper earlier this year on the work in Superior. That's going to be the bulk of the talk today. Um, and then very recently, um, David Cannon, who is working with Kerry Troy down at Purdue, um, did some neat work in Lake Michigan um, looking at um, some uh, uh, turbulence uh, data that they collected. So I want to take a few minutes and distinguish what we're doing in Lake Superior from a lot of these previous studies. And so um, here are a handful of things that I think are different about what we're doing compared to um, this sort of laundry list of other lakes that people have looked at this in. 
um, first of all, we're significantly deeper than all those except for the Lake Babine stuff. And I don't think that's just a matter of degree. I think there are actually different things going on at a qualitative level or, or a process-oriented level um, that you would get in Superior that you wouldn't get in a 10 or 20 or even 50 meter deep lake. I can talk about, I'll talk about that later. Um, we look at whole water column convection. Um, most shallow lakes, uh, and primarily ice covered shallow lakes, will often have a region of stratification at the bottom where you have relatively warm water near the bottom, and then an interior convective layer. So here's a, a review of convection by Buffard and Roost uh, from last year, and then um, from Carillion in 2012, and both of them show this deep stratification, a convective region. And then, um, again, in most cases, excepting the stuff in Lake Michigan, um, there, were, there was surface ice on these lakes. And so you have this micro layer right underneath the ice that allows for the temperature structure to be um, continuous. And so this is a more complicated system in some ways and less complicated in others um, than the work we're doing in Superior. So in Superior, what you're gonna see is we're convecting over the entire water column, we're ice-free, and it's very deep. Um, for people here who are familiar with the classical um, Rayleigh-Bernard convection, which is a classic problem in fluid dynamics, um, there are a couple differences between what we're seeing here and what you would study in a laboratory, like heating up water in a pan or something like that. Um, first of all, um, the classical Rayleigh-Bernard problem, if you sit down and solve it mathematically, you have a flux at the bottom and you have an, an equal and opposite flux at the surface or vice versa. And the fluid is in some sort of steady state with regard to buoyancy. In other words, you're pumping buoyancy in at one boundary, you pump it out at the other. This is not the case here. Here, we're pouring sunlight into the lake and the water, the medium itself is heating up over time. And so that's very different. The other is that in most of the cases where you're solving the problem in some sort of simple sense is that you solve it at a boundary. You put a pan on the stove and there's a temperature boundary at that bottom, or heat flux at that bottom. Whereas when you're pouring sunlight into a lake, you're heating up the euphotic zone. And so that heat is distributed over the bulk of the top of the water column, not just at the surface boundary. And so that complicates the problem as well. Um, Le Po recently referred to this as the ultimate zone of convection. And people who do things like study um, circulation of stars and stuff like that think carefully about, about this. Um, it gets very complicated very quickly. Okay, so I want to present you with a really, really naive view of this, of this process. Imagine that it's the spring and you're in a lake here. I've set it to be 100 meters deep just for fun, 95 meters, I guess. Um, and at the beginning of the day, at sunup, on day one, the water column is uniform in temperature. And when I say uniform, we frequently see in 180 meters of water less than a hundredth of a degree difference between the maximum and minimum temperatures. These are extremely well-mixed water columns. As the sun heats up the, the, the lake, that heating preferentially occurs at the surface, as you might expect. It penetrates over the euphotic zone, and you get a statically unstable water column where you have um, warmer, more dense water near the surface than you do down below. Through convective processes and from from this slide to the next slide is basically the rest of the talk. Um, by day two, you've redistributed that heat over the water column um, and you start all over again. The same process happens ne the next day, the next, the next day, until of course the lake reaches the temperature of maximum density. And even that's a complicated process, as I'll show you later. So here is data from one of Sam Kelly's uh, mooring funded on a separate NSF project. Um, this is in Western Lake Superior. For those of you who are familiar with NOAA buoy or the NDBC buoys, it's near the Western or 45006. Um, and this is, um, I think, a dozen different thermistors all plotted on temperature, I'm sorry, from a dozen different thermistors all plotted on top of each other, except, of course, the water column is very, very uniform, so you can't really see the individual thermistors in this plot. The water column is heating up extremely slowly because it's 180 meters deep. Um, and so it heats up about 1 40th of a degree Kelvin or Celsius every day. So it's one degree Celsius every 40 days as it's heating in the spring, very, very slow. Um, until over here uh, at the end of June, it reaches the temperature of maximum density and it starts to stratify. The really interesting feature here are these little peaks that occur once a day. That 
represents the lake heating up near the surface and then collapsing, heating up, collapsing, heating up, collapsing, day after day after day. I've zoomed in on it over here. Here you can start to see individual colors, but importantly, you can see individual events occurring over the course of the day that last on the order of um, many minutes to a few hours. Um, these we interpret as individual convective cells passing this morning. I've taken the same data and plotted it as a contour plot down here, and you can see it penetrating into the water column over the course of the day and then adjusting at night. And so this is what we really want to focus on is what, um, what is going on over the course of the day. And, and you might say, well, Jay, these are really small. This is 15 one hundredths of a degree. Um, that sounds like a really tiny difference in temperature. But the buoyancy, the instability that that represents is able to completely mix the water column over 180 meters in the space of a couple hours. Okay, so if you are concerned with phytoplankton or nutrients or oxygen or anything else that is subject to circulation, you should be interested in this. Um, another point that I like to make is that if you're interested in sediment geochemistry, you have parcels of water in contact with the atmosphere at the bottom of the lake within a couple hours. Okay, and so you have oxygen rich water constantly in contact with the bottom of the lake. That has to have some, I'm not a sediment geochemist, but that has to have some consequence as far as, um, as far as oxygen balances and stuff like that within the sediment. So here, um, I've taken 30 days of data from this 2017 deployment of SAMS and averaged it down to a single day so that I can get rid of all the noise. I just want to see on average how the lake develops over the course of a day, okay? And so in this top panel, what you see and I'll, I'll point out that most of the plots here are not going to be in universal time, which I would normally do in a talk. They're going to be in local time because I, I'm concerned with the diurnal cycle. And so here, this is uh, the temperature. Um, again, this average of 30 days into one, just so we can see the general features. And you can see that at around 6 in the morning, the surface starts to heat once the sun is up. The surface reaches maximum temperatures, um, maybe... Uh, two to four hours after local noon, um, and then it starts to cool down as mixing overwhelms surface heating. In other words, temperatures being mixed out of the surface layer faster than the sun can heat it up. At the bottom of the lake, the bottom of the lake starts heating up just after noon, and so that means that within six hours, things have gone from the surface of the lake, parcels of water have been convected one way or another from the surface of the lake to 180 meters depth within a couple hours. And I make a really very crude, I do a lot of hand waving in this talk. But if you take 185 meters and divide it by six hours, you get vertical velocities on average of about a centimeter a second. For vertical velocities, that's huge. Um, we like to think of velocities in, in, in lakes and in oceans as largely horizontal. And so these represent relatively large um, uh, con convective velocities. These are plots of very specific things, the average water temperature. Um, I like in cyan, the bottom temperature is steady up to about noon, and you see it warming starting at around noon. Um, the surface temperature starts warming here at about six hours after midnight, at once the sun is out. We can do um, what's called a harmonic analysis to get a sense of the magnitude of that oscillation at different depths and the phase um, of, the, of the heating. And so what we can do is a, a simple... Um, harmonic analysis, we're just convoluting temperature with an um, oscillatory term here. Um, omega is set to be one day, uh, obviously. And the magnitude of how big, if, if you look at the cycle on a daily basis, this tells you how big it is, and this tells you how long after noon, um, or I'm sorry, the phase lag behind this, the solar signal, um, we see at these different depths. So unsurprisingly, the signal is largest at the surface, and decays, uh, but doesn't decay to zero um, at the bottom. And then the phase propagates down. This doesn't represent necessarily a vertical velocity. It just tells you when the temperature is maximum at that particular depth. And you can see that propagate down at about uh, two millimeters per second, although the behavior seems a little bit different below 100 meters than above 100 meters, which is interesting. And we see several other places where we have evidence for this. Um, coincidentally, no notice this uh, 2.2 millimeters per second. Um, this is the work that Farmer did, and he got 
oddly enough, I think coincidentally, the exact same number. Um, and so we see there's reasonable evidence that this seems to be some sort of, um, uh, something is setting that um, phase propagation scale. Um, and it would be one of the things we're hoping to be able to do in the research we're working on right now is understand why it propagates down at that particular speed. Um, here's an analysis of six different moorings of SAMs um, at Grand Marais and at Western. And all of them show the same basic features, although there seems to be a fairly wide range of, of phases and amplitudes. Um, and understanding those differences um, is also on our plate. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk about glider data. Um, and so uh, we operated a glider in Lake Superior up until last summer. Um, this is from 2013. This was a transect that we did um, in conjunction with Michigan Tech, um, where we went from uh, Houghton, or near Houghton, um, up to Isle Royal and back. And I'm just plotting this as a function of time. So this was in uh, the end of June through early July, going from south to north, back south. And what I want to draw your eye to, oh, I'm sorry, this top panel is temperature anomalies. I've taken out the vertical average in each one of these so we can focus on vertical anomalies as a function of time. And in this bottom panel, I'm plotting chlorophyll fluorescence. I'm not plotting chlorophyll content. I'm plotting chlorophyll fluorescence, and those are two different things, and I'll talk about that in a second. What I'd like to draw your eye to, though, are these regions that occur once a day where we see all these little yellow speckles, and those little yellow speckles represent the glider passing through a patch of warm water. And you'll notice that there are also these speckles of very, very low chlorophyll fluorescence um, that seem to occur at roughly the same time. These little parabolic cutouts at the surface are due to photoquenching. In other words, if I have phytoplankton and I shine lots of bright sunlight on them for a while, it doesn't reduce the amount of chlorophyll in that sample, but it reduces their ability to fluoresce. And so if you're looking at a CTD profile that's taken during the day, chlorophyll um, fluorescence values near the surface will be low if the sun is out. Um, not because there isn't chlorophyll there, but because phytoplankton have lost their ability to fluoresce. Um, and so here's, this is from a paper in 2013 of Oliver, um, where this is, this is basically photosynthetic efficiency over time when exposed to bright light. It drops off with time scales on the order of an hour. And then once that phytoplankton gets into a dark region, um, it has the capability of recovering its ability to fluoresce. And so when we look at these plots, I'm not converting chlorophyll fluorescence to concentration because the main signal here is not how much chlorophyll there is, it's whether it's been in the sunlight recently. Okay, two very different things. So um, I showed you these big messy plots and what, what I've done here is the glider moves along this weird, relatively shallow diagonal path, uh, yos as we call them in the glider world. And then we take the data from this diagonal path and we turn it into a vertical profile, right? That's, that's how we do things. Um, and here are two of those profiles um, that I chose arbitrarily um, through, that, through that deployment. And I plotted them on the vertical axis like we always do. That's a reasonable thing to do because in oceans and in lakes, horizontal scales of variability tend to be very, very large compared to vertical scales of variability. If, we, if the glider's going down and it sees a change in temperature, it's probably because it passed through the thermocline, right? It's warm water on top, cold water below. And so we plot things like this. You'll notice here that there's this little tiny blip in temperature and there's a corresponding um, negative anomaly in chlorophyll. So green is chlorophyll, red is temperature. This right here where the chlorophyll value gets very small represents that region of surface photoquenching. And then here's another, again, another arbitrary one where we see a blip in temperature and a corresponding um, anomaly, negative anomaly in chlorophyll fluorescence. It's very unlikely from a dynamical standpoint that there's a layer of warm water, mid-water column that the glider is penetrating. What's more likely is that the glider is moving horizontally through a downwelling chimney. And that downwelling chimney is bringing warm water, but it's also bringing water that's recently been exposed to bright sunlight, which means chlorophyll in that parcel of water 
has been compromised with regards to its ability to fluoresce. And as the glider passes through, we see a drop in chlorophyll and we see a drop and we see a bump up in temperature. I think the more logical way of presenting this data is like this, not as profiles, but as a long track profiles, not as vertical profiles, but as a long track profiles. What this allows us to do is get some vague sense of the lateral scales of convective chimneys. And we can look at this and say, oh, these chimneys are maybe on the order of uh, 10 meters, something like that. Um, but in addition, because there were lots and lots of those little blips, we can actually start to look for, for patterns in, um, in the behavior of these convective chimneys. So here is the messiest plot of the whole talk. On the left-hand side, I've plotted the chlorophyll fluorescence anomaly, and I, I'm, I'm leaving units off of this, and I, I wrote a little algorithm that would, that would identify individual peaks within that, and we identified, I think, 75 different peaks over the course of this four-day deployment. Then we take the, the locations of those chlorophyll anomaly peaks, and we plot those points on temperature. Again, the anomaly, temperature anomaly. Temperature's a little noisier, but these regions of low chlorophyll fluorescence always line up with regions of anomalously high temperature, which is really cool. It gives us two tracers of water that has recently been at the surface. It's been heated and it's been quenched. We can then take these 75 points that we've identified from this relatively short cruise, and we can look at the properties of those, of where we observe the chimneys and how intense they are. And so here, on the horizontal axis, is the time of day that we located these chimneys. Those chimneys always occur between about 10 o'clock local time and about 1800 local time. And I'll point out, I ignore the top 30 meters because that's completely compromised by the direct photo quenching effect. So on top, I've plotted, so that's, that's one indication that this is what's going on, this is what we're observing. They only occur during the daylight hours. That's encouraging. Here, I plotted the intense, intensity of the chlorophyll anomaly as a function of time, and it's just sort of a blob. There doesn't seem to be any real pattern there. But if I plot the depth that we observe those anomalies as a function of time, you can see it deepening over time, which we might expect. It's more likely that we observe these at depth if it takes some finite amount of time for that water to form and then to sink to depth. Um, finally, we can look at the intensity of the chlorophyll anomaly on the horizontal axis. Uh, I'm sorry, we can look at the temperature anomaly on the vertical axis as a function of the chlorophyll anomaly. And the, the black dots represent chimneys that were detected in quote unquote shallow water between 30 and 60 meters. And there's a pretty good relationship there and you would expect that to be the case. Um, the larger the chlorophyll anomaly, the larger the temperature anomaly. Basically it means that um, if you imagine these chimneys um, descending and mixing with ambient water, you might expect there to be some sort of mixing curve that those fall along. And I, I hypothesize that that's what we're seeing here. However, these deep points with little X's represent chimneys that we've observed below 60 meters. I'm sorry, yeah, deeper than 60 meters. Those represent points where there might be mixing between the chimney and the ambient water, but the chlorophyll are also having an opportunity to recover from the photo quenching, and we might expect that the magnitude of the chlorophyll anomaly should be depleted relative to the size of the temperature anomaly. And in fact, I think, I think that's what that is. And oddly enough, if you take 60 meters, again, I'm waving my hands like crazy right now, for those of you on the webinar. Um, if you take 60 meters and divide it by that recovery time of about an hour, you get vertical velocities on the order of a centimeter a second. Okay, so I want to know how big are convection cells? Um, and so we have enough data to get at this. What I want you to do is imagine I have this random field. This is more hand-waving. Um, I want you to imagine a random field of convection cells, and I made them hex hexagons because classically that's what people think of them as. And I want you to imagine that each one of these convection cells has some sort of downwelling chimney of warm water associated with it. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fly a hypothetical glider through this field like this, and it's gonna intersect. The only times I'm gonna notice anything is when it intersects one of these chimneys. I'm gonna detect a little bit of warm water right there but otherwise I'm gonna be steaming along in ambient, relatively cool water. Well, I know from our data set 
that we spend about 5% of our time inside one of these convective chimneys, give or take. Again, this is all order of magnitude. There are no, there's no two significant digits here. Um, and I know the length scale of the chimney is on the order of 10 meters. They're not 100 meters across, and they're bigger than a meter. So I'll call them 10 meters. That means that the area of one of these cells has to be on the order of 100 meters. And if I spend one part of my time in 20 inside one of these cells, it means the area of a convective cell has to be about 20 times the area of the chimney, or about 2,000 square meters, which means that the length scale of one of these convective cells is on the order of 50 meters. Again, very hand -wavy. What it means is that we have to come up with ways of measuring variability on lengths, horizontal length scales of meters to many tens of meters. We're really lousy at doing that. And there's a good reason for it. It's because there's no call for it, right? Um, there, there aren't a lot of examples of processes in lakes or oceans where there's significant variability on, on scales of tens of meters. Um, surface gravity waves, I guess but really not a whole lot beyond that. Okay, so um, we got this uh, stuff funded uh, through NSF, and I want to talk briefly about this. So this is sort of the new stuff right now. Um, we had a large moored array um, that I'll show you details of in a second. Um, the, the sort of centerpiece of that was a large two-dimensional mooring. Uh, I'll tell you what that means in a second. We had a really uh, tricked out meteorology mooring to characterize heat and momentum fluxes. We're very interested in what's causing these buoyancy fluxes at the surface. Um, we had a nice ADCP courtesy of Sam Kelly again, um, signature 500, which has an upward looking beam um, and uh, able to record at very high rates. Um, and then a spar buoy to characterize near surface response. Um, we had UC Davis out and they did a six day deployment of their glider with a Rockland microstructure profiler, a micro rider. Um, and then finally, we had two VMP surveys. VMP is Velocity Microstructure Profiler um, from the deck of the Blue Heron on two separate cruises. Um, here's the location. Boy, I could have made that bigger, huh? Um, that dot right there is roughly the western mooring uh, site in Lake Superior. And this is a layout of our array. Um, this right here is the horizontal mooring. Um, uh, the spar buoy up here a meteorology buoy in the southwest, and then the ADCP, ADCP buoy um, safely far away from the horizontal mooring. This is what this looks like um, from the side, and I, I will point out the scales of this. This horizontal mooring, this is 150 meters tall. Um, it's 350 meters between the anchors. Um, we have what's called the headline here, 18 thermistors um, spaced 10 meters apart over 180 meters. Um, in addition, again, the meteorology buoy, which is further away than I'm showing it here, a spar buoy, which is further away than I'm showing it here, and then an ADCP mooring upward looking at about 60 meters. Um, there are six thermistors spaced very tightly near the surface on the spar buoy, six relatively tightly spaced on the ADCP mooring to give us a sense of what's going on in depth, and then this array with five vertical units um, and the headline um, on this on the on the horizontal or 2D mooring. We've done motion analysis of this. We had pressure sensors all over this, and it basically didn't move. Um, it was nice and stiff. These are huge 37-inch floats um, with um, auxiliary flotation halfway up the line. Each one of these vertical lines had a, a float to compensate for the anchor beneath. Everything was really, really stiff, stayed in location, which was really encouraging. Um, this had been tried once before. A group in Woods Hole did a horizontal mooring back in 98 on George's Bank. Um, they published a great engineering paper about it, but I'm not sure any actual science data got published. Um, and so we were um, pleased to be able to pull this off as successfully as we did. You'll notice that it seems like there should be one more of these strings over here, and you would be right. Um, we managed to lose one of them as we were deploying it. I feel bad about that still, but there's not much you can do about it. Um, this is how many thermistors were out at once, um, which if you've been on doing these sorts of things, this is a lot of stuff to have in one place. Um, this is how much concrete it takes to keep everything on the bottom of the lake. Um, and this is a little dark, but this is how many people it takes um, to get this thing in the water and back out safely um, without it becoming a giant tangled mess. So, um, 
Oh, and for those of you who are familiar with Duluth's iconic lift bridge, um, this is the mooring uh, to scale um, with, the, uh, with the lift bridge below, just to give you a sense of the size of this thing. Okay, here is the, I wanna give you a sense of the basic thermal setting while we were out there. Um, unlike the 2017 data that Sam showed, we did have deep warm water here um, up until the beginning of June. Um, and so here you can see the surface layer heating up. Um, and so we're getting convection over the top 100 meters. This, there's a strong thermocline at about 100 meters here. Um, right here at around the 8th of June or so, um, we entered a period of full water column convection. And you can see those individual daily um, warming and cooling, warming and cooling, or warming and collapsing, warming and collapsing events uh, for about a month. And then what we have, what I call the weird transition phase, where the bottom of the lake has reached the temperature of maximum density, which is about 3.6 degrees, but the surface hasn't reached the temperature of maximum density for the surface, which is about four degrees. And so we spend about a week in the weird transition phase, um, and then uh, the surface finally reaches the temperature of maximum density, at which point you see surface stratification start to form, and the, the deep water is locked into its temperature for the rest of the season. Um, to give you a sense of what those look like, here are two CTD casts during our deployment where you can see the strong thermocline at about 100 meters. Here are two during a mid-season cruise where you can see relatively, relatively uniform uh, water column. A little bit of weird warm water in the surface there on that one, which is probably the surface heating up and adjusting. Um, and then Oh, the, the blue line is the temperature of maximum density. You can see how that decreases with depth. Uh, and then the green is a CTD cast during our recovery cruise, where you can see the temperatures pressed right up against the line of maximum density, and then warm water near the surface. Um, we didn't have a CTD cruise, or we didn't, we didn't have the boat out during the weird transition phase. So I plotted um, thermistor data from instances um, during that period. So here you can see it warmer than the temperature of maximum density in, at depth, and then colder than the temperature of maximum density near the surface um, at night. And this daytime one is even weirder, where it's warmer than the temperature of maximum density at depth, colder for a while, but then warmer at the surface. And so there's a lot of trippy physics going on um, during that phase. Okay, um, take just a second. So this is a basic um, heat budget analysis, and so we have enough stuff on our buoy um, to make estimates of surface heat flux. Um, the blue here is the water column heat content um, calculated from a bunch of thermistors throughout the water column. And then the red is the integrated surface heat flux. It isn't the surface heat flux, it's the integrated surface heat flux. Um, the heat content swings around a bunch early in the season, basically because there's still a thermocline, and a thermocline means heaving up and down. So you get changes in heat content because of that. But once it settles down, we do a really, really good job of predicting the change in heat content from our meteorology buoy. That is important because it tells us that what's going on is quasi one dimensional. We don't have to worry about giant invective events sweeping lots of warm or cold water into our field site during the season. Um, it's largely driven by what's going on right at the surface. The other really important thing here is the average shortwave signal over the experiment was about 245 watts per meter squared, and the total heat flux was 250 watts per meter squared, which means that the contribution from the other surface heat flux terms, latent, sensible, and the net long wave, is relatively small compared to the short wave, which when I step over, I have to, when I go, go and talk to our computational theory colleagues, I can say, here's a really, this problem is simpler than it, um, we, can, we can simplify this problem by ignoring surface heat flux, by ignoring the, the, the surface fluxes, latent, sensible, and long wave. Um, and we don't have to worry too much about advective events. We know that this is really a pretty one-dimensional process. Those are both reassuring things. Um, here's that magnitude and phase analysis that I showed you early from all the data. This is really, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. The magnitude drops off very similar to what we saw before. And we do see the phase, the phase does tend to increased pretty uniformly through the water column. The data from the ADCP mooring is spaced over here almost two hours later than the horizontal mooring data, and that really surprises me. 
because it's about 500 meters away. Um, and I don't know why the response would be substantially different, you know, halfway across the parking lot um, from where the horizontal mooring is. And so that's a little bit of a puzzle right now. So here, this is our first, first light of some actual two-dimensional data. Um, and so um, I'll step you through this. Um, the x-axis here is the position in meters in the horizontal from 10 to 180. The vertical axis is time from a two-day period in May that I just chose arbitrarily. And what I'm doing is I'm taking data in the horizontal and I'm taking out the horizontal average in order to emphasize variability in the horizontal. And what you can see, this is super cool, are these features that propagate across the array in both directions. Um, and we're we pulled this stuff out of the water in mid-July, and it's currently mid-September. So we haven't had a huge amount of time to nail anything down. I think that because when I made this figure, this is um, before we got whole water column um, convection. And so I think this is a, a, a weak, um, basically, Poincaré waves propagating through. And so you're seeing this near inertial oscillation taking these convective cells and dragging it across the array back and forth. But the, the encouraging thing is we picked our scales right. Um, if you zoom in on one of these, and I don't have that slide, unfortunately, um, we're resolving the individual convective chimneys as they're passing through our array, which is really exciting. OK, so this is an animation which isn't running nearly as fast in um, PowerPoint as it did when it was just a GIF. And so what I'm showing here is a two-day period. I'm not going to show the whole thing. Um, a two-day period in June. The little red thing is indicating where on this time series. And then this is a really crude visualization of temperature over this one-day period. And you can occasionally see these plumes reaching down to 60 or 80 meters. So I'm just going to let this ride, and I'll shut up. Here's a bigger event right here. You can see that pressing down right there. Here. Oh, oh yeah, but this should say, yes, it is in local time. So this is local. This is 1 o'clock. Um, this is 1 o'clock in the morning the next day. Yeah, for whatever reason, there's a big peak here later in the afternoon. This is a little more typical right here where you see the maximum things just afternoon. Um, and then at night, it gets very quiet. Um, an alternate view is just looking at stuff along the headline. So this is the 18 thermistors across the top of that big horizontal array. Look at how quiet it is at night. And then as the daytime comes, You see individual features there. And sometimes you'll see these propagate across the array. This is such a big, complicated, I mean, the thing is, we don't have a, we, there's not a lot of precedent for how to visualize this data. Um, doing things in two dimensions like this is tricky. Um, and so I'm at the point where I'm sort of sitting in my office just playing these loops trying to pick out patterns. What I'd like to do is get to the point where we have some objective questions and understand how to ask those questions of this data set. Like, what can we, what can we say about the statistical distribution of chimney sizes from an array like this? Again, I'm not going to let this play the whole way out. Um, so a couple things I'm interested in now. Um, a lot of the um, more data we've showed shows some sort of difference in behavior below about 100 meters. Um, this glider anomaly analysis certainly shows that these bigger temperature anomalies are in the top 100 meters, and there's still some noise down here. Um, but there seems to be something qualitatively different about the bottom 100 meters of the lake. That's why I was saying that I think that Lake Superior is just not twice as much water. There's something fundamentally different going on in these deeper lakes. And so here are my two really sketchy sketches about my question about how these chimneys evolve over time. If you imagine warm water plunging from the surface here and then mixing 
shedding warm water in and then absorbing little eddies of, of ambient cold water, the temperature anomaly inside here is going to decrease and decrease and decrease until it goes away at some depth. And then what happens? Um, or you could imagine, um, there we go. You could imagine that it only sheds warm eddies into the ambient water, in which case the volume of that plume has to shrink with time. And there's going to be some depth at which it goes away. And then what happens after that? And I don't really have answers to that. Um, so here are just some really quick um, microstructure things. Um, do some uh, UMD students and the instrument. Um, it's sort of hard to see in this particular figure. And, oh, I, I used the wrong one. She sent me one in local time. Sorry about that. Um, but it's noisy during the day, and there's more yellows and oranges in the day, and there's more sort of blues and lower amounts of dissipation at night. So we're actually picking out some sort of diurnal signal there. Here she compared um, daytime uh, dissipation values in red to nighttime dissipation values uh, in blue, and there's a, a distinguish or there's a distinct difference there. Um, this is. I got this like two days ago from the colleagues at UC Davis. Um, uh, and so I don't have a huge amount to say, but you see the same thing again here um, with um, large values dissipation um, starting around noon, propagating downwards, um, and then becoming quiet um, later in the night. So here's early in the morning before the sun is up. You can see the next one here. This is a 36 hour window of a six day deployment that they did. So we have many repeats of that data. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, um, radiatively driven convection, or how lakes turn over, if you like to think of it that way, um, is a dominant physical process in these lakes for a month, two months, three months of the year. It's a big chunk of the season, big chunk of the year. And um, we don't know a whole lot about it yet. Um, we observe, um, I didn't show any ADCP data because we haven't quite gotten, um, we're still working on the analysis of all of that. Um, but what I have seen of it suggests vertical velocities on the order of a centimeter a second, and a couple of these little scaling arguments I tossed in here also suggest verticals, vertical velocities in the downward direction on the order of a centimeter a second. Uh, the heat balance is roughly one-dimensional, which is a great relief because it simplifies the problem. Um, we can resolve individual convection chimneys, which have scales on the order of 10 meters, and um, an abundance analysis tells us something about the um, scale of the convection cells themselves. Uh, the very little opportunity we've had to look at data from this huge two-dimensional mooring suggests that we're probably in the right ballpark as far as those scales are concerned. Um, and finally, the character of the response may be different in the top 100 meters from deeper water. And that's something that, especially as our numerical modeling stuff um, enters some level of maturity, we're going to have a much better sense of what's going on there. Um, the next steps, um, I have funding for a second deployment. Um, I had initially suggested Erie. I've come to the conclusion recently it's probably too shallow. I wanted a shallow comparison. Um, and so um, one of the things I'm doing while I'm here today is talking with the, the uh, modeling group um, to get a sense of, of whether Michigan or Huron would be a good target lake for a, a quote unquote shallow deployment. Um, continued analysis, obviously, of this unconventional two dimensional data set. Uh, and then finally, ultimately what we'd like to do is develop a better understanding of the um, vertical development of these chimneys. So um, with that, I will stop and take questions. Thank you very much. Remote audience, so please use the mic if you have questions. And for remote participant, if you have questions, please type it in, and Michelle and Nicole will address your questions. All right. Um, I, I guess I was thinking a lot about how the solar radiation is getting there, and you had one slide where um, there were sub-daily uh, oscillations, and, and you thought those were due to the uh, convective cells, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm wondering sort of what role clouds might play in that. That's a great question. And so one of the things that we would like to do, so the question was uh, what role do subdiurnal variation in solar heating cause? And so, I mean, 
for the more data that I showed, the Sam Kelly data, we didn't have meteorology data for that. And so that's, we can't do anything about that. But what we will be able to do with the buoy, one of the things we're planning on doing is looking at the character of the response on cloudy days versus um, sunny days, but also the character of the response on windy days versus calm days, because you might expect that wind is gonna draw, is gonna cause the mixing to be fundamentally different uh, than on a calm day. But we have not gotten to the point where we're looking at like individual cloudy events. Um, I think that might be tricky at some level to separate out from the fact that the convection cells themselves only occupy a certain fraction of the, the lake surface. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if the background condition uh, will have impact on the, I think, the co uh, convection shell and convection velocity, for example. Some, some you have uh, more ice cover and some you have less ice cover which means the background temperature and certification uh, may be quite different. Well, so this deployment was entirely during a period of ice, it was entirely ice free. So, I mean, if, if, if you're gonna compare one lake to the next, if you're gonna compare this lake to Lake Onego or Pavilion or something like that, then you have to start thinking about ice cover. But this deployment and any deployment we're gonna do in Superior is gonna be during a period, during an ice free period. The other thing about there not being ice, another big distinction there, well, first of all, um, if you're an ice covered lake, you don't have to worry about uh, mixing effects due to wind. And so we're gonna get this range of behavior because we're ice free. The other thing is the buoyancy flux in the ice free case, because you don't have ice, ends up being a lot larger. In other words, there's a lot more sunlight getting into the water if there isn't ice. And so there are definitely gonna be effects of there being ice or not being ice. But in this case, it's, it's ice free the whole time. Any okay. question in the audience? Go ahead, thank you. I'll ask another one about solar radiation. Okay. Uh, you're showing that uh, the, the solar radiation input is nearly equal to the total net um, right. uh, heat flux. And um, I'm, I'm thinking, that's got to vary diurnally, and you're looking across the season. So, um, at at shorter time scales, that's going out of balance. I'm yeah, sure absolutely. So that's a great point. Um, the the mean of the other three fluxes added up to about five watts per meter square. I don't remember exactly which one was which, but latent sensible and and net long wave in the mean add up to about five. Instantaneously, can be as large as about a hundred watts per meter squared in total. Um, which is still small compared to the thousand watts per meter squared that you get at noon um, from from solar radiation. So there may be some aspects, and I I actually did just put this together for um, to share with the other co-PIs, a slide that had solar radiation and a slide that had the other three added together. And there were some periods where you have a day or two where those other three terms you know are consistently 100 meters per. Uh, watts per meter squared or something like that. But it's rarely, in, in total, rarely larger than about that. So it is, I think, fair, at least from the perspective of justifying throwing those out for the first cut with the model. Um, it'll be interesting, once we have a better understanding, to go back and look for those periods where there was a significant flux of one sign or the other from those other three. Or like the, the, the deployment that Cannon uh, et al. wrote about in Michigan, um, there's actually a lot of cooling in that case. I haven't quite figured out the, why the, the period they were out, actually there was a fair amount of nighttime cooling, um, which we don't see a lot of in this deployment. Um, so there certainly are gonna be situations where those other terms dominate the in, instantaneous behavior of the water column. All right. Okay. Any questions? Uh, we don't have any question from the remote participant. All right, well, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, All right. thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I think Jay will stay around for another half hour, so we'll probably talk to Jai and Dima on some of the Lake Superior